Wealth doesn't just happen. You have to go after it and build it. And the chase can be packed with thrills, frustration, and adventure. Join hosts Gail and Chris on a journey into mortgage notes, a little-known but fascinating type of real estate investing that's full of human drama and perfect for growing your IRA or savings. We build wealth by working with distressed borrowers who are fighting to keep their homes, and that's why we call it Good Deeds Note Investing. We're doing good and making money. Join us. Do you have a need for legal counsel for your foreclosure, forfeiture, or eviction in Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan, or Illinois? Do you have an account in bankruptcy in those states and need to discuss the matter and your options? How about an account that goes into bankruptcy in any of the 94 bankruptcy jurisdictions? The attorneys and staff at Sotilian and Barilli are here to assist you with those matters and more. Head on over to our Facebook page or our website at www.sotilianbarilli.com to find out more and to reach out to our team. When legal default experience matters, choose the team at Sotilian and Barilli. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I am your co-host, Chris Seventy, here with Gail Greenberg. Gail, how are we doing today? Very well, Chris. I have a killer what just happened segment that's just perfect for the holidays because it's so heartwarming. So, okay, so go yeah, ahead. I'm just going to dive right in. I'm just going to talk right over you. So I have a young joint venturer who funded a deal in Indiana. And the house, it's a kind of a nice little house in a small town. And when we first took it over, we thought there was a reasonable chance for reinstatement. And instead, during all our time trying to reach out to the borrower and connect with him and his wife, we never really got to talk to them. So our next step was that we would send, you know, a demand letter to say, okay, folks, one way or another, you need to talk to us because we're your lender and you're behind, so let's chat. But instead of contacting us, they just moved out. And that was a sad situation. And then it created some complexities because we had to hunt them down to serve them notice of the court date and all those things. But all of that aside, we eventually got possession of the house and we fixed it up a little bit and we just put signs out on the front lawn. And about two days after the signs went up, I received a call from a gentleman who is 60 years old. And he told me that his grandfather actually built that house and his grandparents lived there, but he never actually saw the inside because they lost possession of it during an economic downturn. It wasn't the depression because the house was built in 1932 or 1935 but it was a personal depression of theirs and they lost the house so for his entire life he's been driving by that house he's never been inside and now he's come to see it and they're thinking very seriously of buying it and both the JV and me are just every time we talk about it we start crying and we're just really hoping they'll buy it and we're going to do whatever we can to make it affordable to them <laughs> because we love their story. It's so beautiful. Uh, another Gail Greenberg Lifetime Network special coming. <laughs> <laughs> I cry my way through most days in this business. There's always something. My what's happening now isn't really as exciting for me in doing due diligence on six assets that I recently got accepted from a hedge fund that we both uh, do business with. So it started out as kind of two assets and ended up growing to, hey, we've got a few more on our books. Do you want some of these? And I said, look them again and said, no, not really. And then they came back and said, well, you know, if you take these two at this price, we'll throw in these other ones. And once that occurs, I'm like, uh, sure, why not? So I'm right now, you know, doing due diligence on six more assets and also got another 10 bids outstanding that hopefully I'll hear about early next week. So that's my exciting news for what I've got really focused and going on right now. Well, so much for a peaceful, quiet and relaxing no work holiday for you. Exactly. Yes, it will be, you know, the due diligence, actually one of them, had a little surprise in it that I noticed so far, actually, uh, the loans in bankruptcy, which I enjoy buying bankruptcies, but also it has a balloon payment on in a few years as well, not shortly after it gets out of bankruptcy in the house. 
you know, has pretty close to some equity. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to possibly get them through the bankruptcy and then work with them to try and get them refinanced with some of these new lenders out there that do refinance people after 12 months of bankruptcy. So we'll see. Yeah. So you say after the bankruptcy is over and chapter 13 bankruptcy lasts five years, but a very small number of people actually make it the whole five years. So do you have a particular reason to think that this one will go the distance? Well, I'm hoping it does. But typically what I've found is, like you said, bankruptcy is five years. And one of my little secrets is I like to buy notes that have been in for at least 24 months, because I think people at that point in time start to see the light at the end of the tunnel where, hey, look, if I can stick this out for another, you know, I've been doing it for two, two and a half years, continue to do it for another two, two and a half years, then any unsecured debt in the chapter 13, like credit cards and things like that, pretty much get wiped. So at the end of that, then debts are really only secured debts, which are their car payment and their house, as long as they don't go rack up more credit card debt. But, you know, bankruptcy, the way it can work can really help somebody out. And especially on a mortgage, once you're out of the bankruptcy and your debt's restructured, gives, you know, more cash flow typically for them to continue to pay the mortgage. You know, I, I've always wondered this and I've never thought to ask anyone, when you declare bankruptcy, do you have to surrender your credit cards? Like, do you have to do anything like that? Don't know. Typically, <laughs> I'm guessing the credit card companies would cut you off from that. Typically, I'm guessing the cards get closed by the credit company. Never filed bankruptcy, hopefully never have to. So I don't know. Yeah. So how would the credit card companies even know? It goes on your credit history uh, and then they would see it there? Well, once you file bankruptcy, you have to list the list of creditors and right. they get notified and they file what's called a proof of claim, which is a document basically proving how much is owed, which that's something, a topic for, I think another podcast is a whole chapter on bankruptcy. Yeah, absolutely. I actually just filed my first proof of claim. I was shocked. It's like a 50-page document. I thought, seriously? Why is everything so complicated when it gets legal? Holy cow. It's called the government, too. Yes, I guess we can't just blame it on attorneys. <laughs> the government gets a little share of the blame, too. So, you know, you mentioned you're doing due diligence on several, by my count, sounds like about 16 or 22 <laughs> assets. I'm a little confused at this point. Six under agreement, can I put bids on? Okay. Right here. Okay, got it. You bid off a lot there, sir. So we thought for our main topic today, let's talk about how we look at a tape, the spreadsheet that has all the note information on it. Like, what does it look like? What do we do when we get it? And then if we bid successfully, what's our process after that? So this will be a real notes and bolts kind of a main topic today. And we actually should, now that I've said notes and bolts, we should remind everybody we have a Facebook group called Notes and Bolts. I was just on there adding to what is probably our crowning achievement on that Facebook group, our crowdsourced document we have of toxic assets and why you might want to avoid them. And that's something where everyone contributes information that they have discovered about certain notes that keep getting presented over and over again on tapes. And we started that spreadsheet so that people would not keep investigating and spending money researching the same toxic assets over and over again. <laughs> so protect yourself, protect your friends, always use our spreadsheet before you buy. Yes. And it's not nuts and bolts, it's notes and bolts. Just a yeah. reminder for somebody who thought it was nuts and bolts, but... <laughs> So, so <laughs> no, that's a hard so way Gail, so, on Facebook, yeah. yeah. So, Gail, so for your bidding strategy, you don't put a projector on the wall with a, a Nerf dart gun and just start firing away at assets to figure out which ones you want to bid on, or is that your secret sauce? How do you start out once you get a tape? Well, I would say you have, of course, now revealed what was my process initially when I was a young node investor many, many years ago. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, when I was new with this, I would get a tape and some of them are giant, you know, they could have like hundreds and hundreds of assets on. And I would literally just start at the top 
with the first one and I would just start researching houses. And I don't think that I should be totally, you know, ridiculed for this because when I have watched people do due diligence demos on videos, that's kind of what they do. It's like, oh, let's look at some houses. Now, because I have very specific criteria that I'm looking for financially and in terms of returns, looking at the house itself is kind of one of the last things I do. My first approach when I get a big tape or even a small tape is that I make some additional columns on it. One is for if I have historical experience with the note seller and I know that they normally want you know, 50% of UPB or 48%, 60%, whatever it is, I will make a column and I will, in that column, put in a formula that takes the UPB, the unpaid balance, and multiplies it by that percentage that I know is kind of the sweet spot for that seller. And then I will create another column that is the return on investment at that price, at that bid price, assuming I would get it at that price. And that's another formula that is as simply... PI payment, the principal and interest payment, times 12, so the yearly PI income, divided by the bid price. So PI times 12 divided by the bid price. And that gives you, that's your gross ROI on that. So essentially, you're taking what you think the cash flow is for that year, the principal and interest payment, multiplying it by 12 months to see what you're going to get if it's performing for the year. And divide it by what the, I paid. Um, yep, what you paid to, you know, or what you're willing to pay. Exactly. So the unspoken aspects of that are: I'm actually not going to get that full PI payment because I have servicing costs, and I usually have insurance costs too. Because most of these people <laughs> do not, you know, if they're not paying their mortgage payment, they're not paying for their insurance either. And even after they start paying for their mortgage, they often won't pay for their insurance. Do you find that's the case? If you have some special uh, thing of getting them to do it. Well, I mean, I have the servicer collect escrow and I send the insurance payments to the servicing company to put in. And when they pay for the escrow, the servicing company reimburses me those costs. Yeah, well, a lot of my particularly contract for deed borrowers because they are very low income people. Hi, doggies. You know, we don't succeed in getting an escrow payment out of them. And I have also been at a service or FCI who won't collect escrow unless the loan is current. So unless someone totally reinstates, they won't do an escrow account. So okay. that's why I'm not boarding any new loans there. Like it's just so difficult. <laughs> mm-hmm. So anyway, oh, yeah. we, we should try not to digress too much and stay on no. our, what do we do? Yeah. So a few questions I had when you start looking at that is, and you mentioned you spend a little more time looking at the tape first versus assets. Are there specific price points you look at? Well, the contract for deed tapes, there's never anything with a higher than, say, $80,000 unpaid balance on there. So your purchase price is going to be less than fifty. I find, particularly with new JVs, that that's where they're comfortable. They're really mostly comfortable in the kind of the $25,000 purchase price range. So yeah, that's where I kind of focus. Okay. And is there a dollar value or a value of the house that anything below a certain value you don't look at? A lot of people have a number. I think, obviously, anything under $25,000 in value is going to be a, a very special needs house. And probably your borrowers are going to be pretty marginal in terms of their income. And it's always, you know, it's a big risk having borrowers who are so close to the edge in financial terms all the time. Because anything that happens in their life can really throw them off in terms of making their payments. So with a contract for deed, you know, there's also a pretty good chance you might get the house back. So you just have to ask yourself, do I really want a $10,000 house, you know, in Akron, Ohio? Is there a principal and interest payment that if it's below a certain threshold because of servicing costs, you're basically like not worth my time? Yeah, I mean, I don't really like to go below 175 or $200 because it just gets, again, though, I'm having to pay my own insurance most of the time. So, you know, so between servicing and insurance, you're talking like, $75 a month, 
getting deducted from your PI payment. So yeah, you basically <laughs> you're not making anything. And on a tape that I know a seller recently had, without naming sources and stuff, because you know I think the deal probably hasn't closed, but an asset I bid on did have a low payment. Um, I sometimes bid on those, but when I do, your bid's usually only you know one, two, three thousand dollars, and it's you know basically sometimes just little. IRA money that not really too overly concerned with that you can keep it in for a while. But I know somebody did fifteen, twenty thousand dollars on an asset that is only at, you know, paying your net after servicing and stuff is gonna be under under a hundred dollars a month. So they're gonna basically gain a thousand dollars a year, but when you're paying fifteen thousand, it's gonna be fifteen years before you get your money back. So I think that's one thing people don't look at or realize is you got to look at it holistically. You just can't take a number and multiply, like on a performing note, oh, I'll pay 80% of the UPB. You got to also right. look at your principal and interest payment. Yeah, so, well, yeah. Now that's why the ROI column is really handy as yeah. kind of an alert. Yeah. If your yeah. ROI is 25%, I mean, if you were keeping all of that money, that's a four year payback. If it's 33%, that's a three year payback. Yeah. It gives you kind of a quick yeah. reference for how long before you're going to get your money back. Another question I was going to ask is states, you know, people hear the terms judicial and non-judicial, which judicial means you have to go through the courts to take a property back and non-judicial is it's not done through the courts and it's much quicker. And as a note investor, do you distinguish between the two or are there certain states you typically avoid or do you avoid all judicial states? What's your thoughts? So when I'm looking at a tape, one of the first things I'll do is that I will do the, what's it called? Filters. Yeah, you know, the way you can click in the top line of a tape or a spreadsheet and you'll often get the chance to filter. So it will bring up a drop down menu of every state that's on the tape. And I will get rid of certain states that just because, well, I can tell you Kentucky is one because of the really harsh licensing rules there. I'm just never going to buy in Kentucky. It's very expensive to be licensed, and apparently it's very, very dire consequences if you try to buy there without a license and you get caught. So do you have states that you eliminate? Well, I guess so, for conventional loans, I would also eliminate most of New England. For contracts for deed, that would not be the case. But it's interesting that even a harsh judicial state, if you're buying a contract for deed, might not be a very expensive or long-lasting repossession experience. Yeah, so typically I'll say, after experience has taught me now, I like to stay, you know, as I say, south of the Mason-Dixon and east of the Mississippi um, is kind of my area. But, you know, there's even, like you said, New York, New Jersey, I stay out of. Pennsylvania, I'm not a fan of for notes anymore. And Ohio, I'm very skittish on Ohio just because of having experience there. And, uh, and <laughs> You have not received a warm welcome in Ohio. <laughs> no, and also in certain areas, you've got to be careful because of if you foreclose and take a property, I can't think of the term off the top of my head, but especially in like Cleveland, and I think it's north and east side of Cleveland, basically, if you take the property and try and sell it, the county or city or jurisdiction comes in and does an inspection. And what they'll do is they'll say, okay, before you sell it, you have to fix all these things. A point of sale inspection is what it's called. And then they'll hold a bond where you have to put a bond up or put money in escrow and then also pay for the repairs. So they'll say, okay, you got to spend 10000 in repairs. You have to give them money in escrow, plus you have to go fix it. So in the time it takes to foreclose in Ohio and so forth. It's Ohio, you know, compared to some of the other Rust Belt states like Michigan and Indiana, it's quicker to foreclose. Michigan, you got to be careful because there is a six month redemption period there, but you know, it's still not that bad of a process. So yeah, I mean, my primary states right now are Virginia, Maryland, which most people stay away from Maryland, but I've got so much boots on the ground there. North Carolina, I like Indiana, Michigan, Tennessee. Those are kind of a lot of the primary states. And also having boots on the ground in states yeah. where you have people that you know is really important. And really? I recommend to everybody as part of looking at a tape, you know, hey, do you know a realtor? Do you know a property manager? Do you know a contractor in those areas? Because eventually you're going to need them. Right. Yeah. I mean, 
I don't think in today's market it's possible to just really throw away a lot of states because obviously we have no control over what is presented to us as far as, you know, the selection of states. So I think it's good to just have a process for kind of getting to know people in an area if you see a lot of assets in there. And I just wanted to go back to the spreadsheet and yep. say, all my make is just notes, which would be like comments to myself so that when I do actually start going through it, I can just write down what the online values are, anything, questions I have about once I look at the picture and just start gathering information when I'm in the due diligence process. But that's not yet. I will look up the ones that I get seriously interested in. That's where I would write down any taxes that I see are mm -hmm. owed and, you know, just any kind of warning or pertinent relevant information that would affect the bid that I make. That's an interesting comment that you just made that you threw in there, taxes. So we talked about kind of filtering a spreadsheet and looking at it and adding some columns. And then as you know, once you start shortening that list of a certain thing, you mentioned taxes. So sounds like, and this is something I recommend, you go online and do a property tax search to see what the taxes owed are on that property. Yeah, exactly. I don't have your fabulous tool for that, but I do the best I can by no. going on to Netter Online, N-E-T-R-O-N-L-I-N-E.com, which is your gateway to every county website that's out there for taxes, recorder's office, assessor. And yeah, most of the time you can find out the taxes though. Sometimes you'll see that there are no taxes owed and it really just means that taxes have gone to tax sale. <laughs> so you're not out of the woods. So this is only a very preliminary thing that we do initially just to decide what we're going to bid on. And sometimes you get a surprise because you think the taxes are up to date and then you get a terrible surprise later after you've already had a bid accepted that you now have to try to fight <laughs> to get it reduced a little because of the taxes. So really what we do is on the spreadsheet, you know, I create these columns. I make my initial determinations about what I'm interested in bidding on. But before I actually make the bids, I will call those counties and find out exactly what the situation is with the taxes because you and I both know it is so rare. It is as rare as a pink flying elephant that a seller having accepted your bid is going to now let you lower it. So I want to jump back quickly um, to the spreadsheet before we get into, you know, once you sort the spreadsheet. I had one other question is, do you look at when the borrower last made a payment and how far behind they are? Yeah, in general, obviously you don't want them to be that far behind, but you can also have a big payday if they are really far behind and they want to stay. So it's a little bit of a gamble that sometimes really pays off, but I am very interested in the last payment received date because that shows me that they're still engaged. They're still there usually, though I think one of us had a vacant house where somebody was still paying occasionally, which yeah. is, that's a plus. Yeah, I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you had that, right? Yeah I, yeah, I still do. They're paying and because they're renovating it to eventually rent it out and their payment's so low right now that, you know, it's a few hundred bucks a month and I guess we're working on a few other projects and so forth, but you know, hey, as long as they're paying, I'm fine with that. And they're actually increasing the value of the home. I agree. I look at when did they make their last payment because that's important. Because if they haven't made a payment in two years, you know, you could be in for a fight. You know, if they're still there where, or it might take a little longer to work it out. Whereas if somebody's making payments, it gives you this sense that they want to stay. And with, you know, the goal typically being to try and get the borrower on a new plan and staying in the property, knowing when that last payment was made is big. Right, exactly. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I would say in general, if someone hasn't paid in a year and a half, I pretty much assume I could end up owning that house. But I have a friend, and this happened like when I was really new in this, she bought in Michigan a, not a contract for deed, but an actual loan where the people had not made a payment in 10 years. <laughs> and they reinstated. I mean, obviously, 
that was a huge negotiation and she ended up waiving, you know, quite a bit of the arrears to get them kind of re-engaged. That's interesting because one thing you got to check on is statute of limitations because after so many years in most states, there's mm-hmm. laws that you can't collect it anymore. It's basically the debt is white. And there's states where if you file foreclosure and stop, then you cancel it or you rescind it and you file foreclosure so many times but never follow through with it. Again, you can also, you know, that can kick off events that might not make that debt collectible. So there's a lot of, I'll say, nuisance laws and regulations like that, that yeah. personally, I'll tell you, I don't know all of them. And that's why I always have an attorney review everything. And typically, if it's been a long time since they paid, I'll ask them more, you know, look in the file and say, hey, look, is this debt still redeemable and collectible? So Yeah. Well, I mean, most of the sellers that we deal with, mm-hmm. you know, if something has been, you know, no payments for three years or whatever, they do mm-hmm. foreclose. And then, you know, they yeah. present us with spreadsheets of REOs, which are mm-hmm. bank-owned properties, lender-owned properties in their case. But yeah, I've seen tapes where there are things on there where the next due date's in 2004. <laughs> 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 like, what in the world have you people been doing all of this time? <laughs> and how are they still in the property? Maybe they're not. So, yeah, that is true. So, Gail, now that you've filtered the tape, you know, I've talked about, I use Data Tree to go on, look at things and look at the property and Zillow, Realtor, Trulia. But when people say look at the property or do look at, you know, those websites, what are you looking at? Oh, when you go on to a website like that? Yeah, um, because everyone talks about going using those websites, but somebody's starting out and I'd say, that's great. I'm going to Google or Zillow or Trulia. I'm like, what am I supposed to be looking at? Well, I don't have a macro to do this, but you might. Some people have a way of doing on spreadsheets, like pulling the Zillow, Realtor, and Trulia values, yep. first of all. I've started to do that manually on the small number that I'm really focused on and just sort of averaging them to see, get kind of a ballpark idea. I look for the photos also. There are often photos that are not current, but they are the photos from when the house was sold to the current borrowers. And you can kind of see how raw it is. And a lot of times borrowers, they buy these with the intention of fixing them up. I think the majority of time, particularly with the lower valued stuff, they don't really get fixed up at all. They might get patched up temporarily. But I actually sold a house to a guy in Flint, Michigan. He's done extensive work on it. Like that does happen. This is the holy grail that we all seek, but rarely find. So yeah, I figure the pictures kind of give you a ballpark idea of what the place looks like. I mean, you can see things like, does it have hardwood floors? Does it have, you know, I bought a house that had little stained glass windows. That turned out to be the house from hell for me. <laughs> but it looks so charming. It wasn't a church, you mean? It was a cute little house in St. Louis. I thought uh, I mentioned it to you. Yeah, a few things I look for is, like you said, I'll look at the pictures, but then I'll go on Google uh, Maps and then do the street view. And I'll check to see, okay, has the house color, is the paint color changed or you know, you can see, you know, was there a new deck put on the house and things. Like you said, you can see pictures previously from some of those sites and then go on Google Street View to see. I like to go on the Google Street View also to kind of take a look at what the adjacent neighbors and properties look like. I used to have the, a scraper that did that for Zillow, Truly, and Realtor, but I scrapped it, no pun intended, because using Data Tree. You know, I get a map that blows of the area that shows all the REOs, all the properties currently for sale and all the properties that have sold. So right then and there, I can just quickly look at and see, okay, what are the comps for a three bedroom, one bath, 1200 square foot house in that area? That's much more accurate than looking at, you know, Zillow, Trulia. I've had a house recently that the Zillow value went from 95,000 down to 50,000 in one week. And I know, you know, the economy's still doing okay. I don't think house prices drop 50% in the span of one week. Yeah. I've never seen this. And I think we would all love to know like how they determine the property values on those sites. Now that Julia is owned by Zillow, it's weird that they still vary, but they only vary by a couple hundred dollars now. It used to be, you know, they would come to some really different conclusion. Well, the like CEO of Zillow, there was an article that his house 
you know, basically he sold it or had it listed and the Z estimate was off by like 40% or something. So if the CEO can't get his house right, then what's the odds of getting yours or somebody else's? Yeah, it's tough um, because I think people, yeah. when you're selling a house retail, people definitely mm-hmm. look at that and it can be just completely mm-hmm. insane. Other things, you know, check crime. You know, also, you know, I had a house and I like to Google the address because there's that property we recently, I had put a bid on and then during due diligence, I was Googling it and found out that there was a teenager shot and killed inside the house. So I'm like, I'm going to pass on that one. The way we check for crime is to go on Trulia and they will give an overall rating that it's either low for the county, low amounts of crime, moderate or high. But even if it's moderate, you're not sure how much of a concern it is, you can click on that little box and it will show you an actual map and it will show you where different crimes have been reported and what the crimes actually were. And sometimes you see like a moderate crime, which would alarm me, you know, like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? But click on the map and you'll find out it's like shoplifting hit and run accident, you know, it's not anything that really is something we're all afraid of in our neighborhood. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So Gail, as we start to wrap up this segment, is there anything else you'd like to add as part of, you know, once you start looking at a tape, which, you know, just in case people are listening and really new to notes, a tape is also, I forgot to mention this, I think a list of assets that are for sale, they just call them a tape. So it might have five, might have 500 assets on it, but They call them tapes is what your list is. Yeah, I find it really helpful when you're looking at a big, particularly when you have a very large tape of assets, and it's very easy to get confused, that if you have certain things that are important to you, like you want an ROI over a certain number, I will sort by that number, and then I will color all of those rows a certain color. And then if I resort by some other criterion, like how recently there was a payment, then I can instantly see in those now top ranking, the most recent payment things, which ones are also the highest ROI. And it helps me to really focus on the assets that are the highest priority to me. Yeah. One thing I'll do is the first call my ad is I call it further review. And I basically put a yes or no. And basically, I'll do the states I invest in and I'll put a yes. And the states I don't invest in, I put a no. And then I filter that down. And then the ones that are still yeses, I'll go back and then look at, okay, what's the price points on them? You know, if it's a $400,000 UPB and a $600,000 house, I'm putting a no. And then I kind of take that list and continue to chip away at it very quickly to get down to, okay, here's the 10, 20, 30 I want to focus on. Well, that's a good tip. So I think we'll wrap up that segment and go on to our final segment of newly named Notes and Bolts segment of some insider information, Gail. Is there anything you would like to add that is a nice little, I'll say, ninja tip for people out there uh, as they continue to grow? This is where the juicy tips get revealed, everybody. So stop what you're doing. (laughs) Everyone get very quiet. Shut off your phones. I have given this one before, but... Now that we're talking about looking at tapes and avoiding toxic assets, this cannot be stressed enough. I never used to ask for the servicing notes on assets. Now I absolutely always do because I just added to our toxic asset list a house that I was very interested in in North Carolina. It looked absolutely beautiful. Turned out the thing was gutted on the inside by a fire and then to add insult to injury, had a tree crash through the roof. So there's no way, even I sent someone there, they photographed it, it looked great. I would never have known. That is like the biggest issue is finding out those kinds of things and also finding out what the conversations have been with the servicer that will tell you whether you're going to get a reinstatement or not. Thanks for stealing mine, Gail, because that's (laughs) what I actually had. So I can always tell what you're about to say. So don't let me go first. Well, thankfully I'm an engineer. I have a little paper here that I have like 10 of these written down for the next 10 episodes. So I can quickly spin into a new one. And the one I'm going to spin into is I'm in the process of selling a property owner finance, and it's going to be a mortgage and a note on it, or I'm going to finance it to a buyer. And the thing that always comes up is about having title insurance. And whether you're buying a note or going to finance a note, 
to make sure it has title insurance on it. And we may have mentioned that before, but that is a must. And just as an FYI for the people out there, because I asked this question, typically the buyer of the house in this instance that I'm financing, they typically will get their own title insurance. And as part of that, they should be the one paying for the lender's title insurance as well. It's usually the same title company that does it and they just kind of do tag the policy onto it. So that's always out there. Okay, who's paying for the title insurance and so forth? And I asked my attorney this question actually yesterday, Brian, and Brian's like, well, I know you own a house. I said, yes. He goes, well, you know, you paid for the title insurance and you paid for the bank's title insurance. So you're the bank. So the buyer should be paying for it. So just wanted to make that comment on notes is, again, as part of due diligence, the servicing comments. And once you get the collateral, make sure there's title insurance in there because it could be very, very imperative. Otherwise, you might have to do quiet title or some other action, which can cost you a few thousand bucks if there's ever an issue. Excellent. Good point. All right, great. Good. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you all for listening and stay tuned for more episodes of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. And as always, we hope you will start to go out and do some good deeds. Thanks for tuning in to the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast with Chris Seveny and Gail Anthony Greenberg. If you like what you just heard, feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues, as well as drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. You can visit our website at www.gooddeedsnoteinvesting.com to sign up for email updates for future shows and access all of our great content, including show transcripts, case studies, video tutorials, and more. Don't forget to join us next time for another episode on building your wealth and making a difference.